This is Craig Herndon. Welcome to the Virtual Reality Podcast. Today we are at the Virtual Reality and Healthcare Symposium 2018 at the Harvard Medical School. And we have Eric Vizzoli of GoTouch VR. So he is the youngest awarded by the European Commission for Outstanding Research in Applied Entrepreneurship at the MSCA 2017. He's one of the most cited young haptic scientists in the world. He published 23 scientific papers uh, and opposed five patents. Uh, so, Eric, thank you for coming on. It's uh, great to meet you. Thank you very much for the invite. Um, so, why don't you go ahead and just kind of describe your background um, in haptics and what kind of drove you along that path to get your PhD and start doing research in the area? So, uh, I'm, as a, as a formation, I studied, my master was in physics. So, I'm a physicist, actually. And uh, it was pretty strange, the path the that brought me to haptics. And I, I like to resume it in this way. I was working high energy physics in particle accelerator stuff. It was really nice in uh, synchrotrons, really cool. The problem it was that every science that was going there, it takes like one, six months, one year, two years just to get, you know, like 10 minutes, 15 minutes of availability of the resources. And after during my master, it was the resources was not stable. So I throw away in the garbage two years of, two years of work just because wow. it, it wasn't possible to do it. I mean, I got my master, everything, but I decided ah, if I want to do science, I want to do something that I can touch. And, See. you know, it, it was actually <laughs> it's really stupid. But then I pulled up the offers of PhDs and I found the description of this project about studying how can actually human can interact and touch. At that point I say, OK, I'm going to get this one. And I enter in the haptics world for this reason, because they wanted to have something that it was really so spot on. And that is what I love about, love about haptics. It is so easy to understand if something works or doesn't work because it's, you touch it. Right. And it's so you either feel it or you don't. Exactly. And that's the best thing I said. It is the most immediate, probably, feel that you can get. If something works, it works straightforward. And you get it in two seconds. Right. And that's how I decided to go to haptics. And the PhD from there was just blind passion, let's say. <laughs> I work days and nights because I was loving, I still loving what I'm doing. So <laughs> I became absolutely passionate about how, how people interact, how people touch and how people feel. It's, it's what they don't sleep in the night for. Uh, so there's a lot of that trying to understand uh, how we perceive touching uh, and, and like how we react to things. It's, I mean, haptics is a, uh, uh, it's, um, let's say, bidirectional sense. The haptics is a way that you feel something but this feeling also uh, influences your behavior. So you search for the feeling because you move your hand and you go towards something. And these feelings um, influence what you do next. I see. What you, so it's a bidirectional sense and haptics in general, it's a strange beast that stays between uh, neuroscience, uh, neurophysiology, which is how you actually, your body works, I mean, mechanically. And, uh, and the other aspect on there is engineering is building haptic displays. Okay. So haptics is all around there. So it, it's building devices that communicate things that are innate to us. So for example, um, like if I touch a fire, I feel heat, I'm going to instantly want to move my hand back. Yeah, um, that is a, that is a thermal, thermic displays. That's a, a, a typology of haptic device. Right. And so is that just one section of haptics? Or I mean, haptics is concerns everything, which is uh, tactile stimulus and the thermal stimulus. This is haptics. I see. And there's not pain. There's not another kind of stuff. So haptics is really concerned touch and heat. I see. And in haptics, it's pretty strange because it, the, everybody thinks that you want a, a, a tool that does everything, right? That you do. It's perfect. You do, you do the, the mechanical, you do the textures, then you do the heat, and you need to put everything together, and it's fantastic. But actually, the haptics is really divided into verticals, let's say. I see. Uh, because the, um, the requirements for these devices are so strong uh, that it's really difficult to couple them in a meaningful manner and in a usable manner for the, for the final user. So uh, you said different verticals. Are yeah. you thinking of any verticals in particular? I mean, it's, uh, let's say, thermal displays have, uh, they, they transfer heat, have really different um, engineering constraints than tactile displays. Yep. That uh, the display stiffness, that's a really different uh, um, ergonomic constraints that the tactile display that uh, delivers textures. You know? I see. So it's like um, like a bump. 
or something like that, that, that kind of texture? Or? No, no, real texture. I mean, there is technology that, that that's part of my PhD is on, was on that, that it can reproduce really, really fine textures, you know, really, really uh, refined, really dense and really high quality textures that, you, you know, you, you pass your hands over. Like sandpaper? Yeah, sandpaper, but even better. Even if you get something really more refined, more smooth. It's like we are capable of, let's say, if I put five different reproduced textures, you are capable to assign the reproduced textures to the real material. So you are capable to to assign them. That has been proven. I see. And this is a kind of technology, but it's totally different. Does it have anything to do with something that is meant to reproduce, let's say, softness? I see. Really, really different kind of mechanical technology. Right. And I assume, um, so when we talk about virtual reality and, and like training, um, so I guess something that would be used uh, for entertainment or like in a shooter kind of entertainment setting versus um, in, in like a medical setting are going to have completely different requirements for the kinds of things that they want to do. Absolutely. And, and you're yeah. saying that it's just hard to pair those requirements in an all-in-one device that does everything? Absolutely. That is uh, absolutely what I... But I'm in convinced in haptics and how haptics works because haptics is a mechanical problem. So basically, yeah. haptics is mechanics, besides of thermal stuff, but all the rest is mechanics. But the task that you want to solve generates the engineering. So, for example, if you want to uh, uh, enable manipulation of a ob of virtual object, it's completely different than if you want to reproduce the textures over a virtual object, right? See. Because the Mechanical constraints, bandwidth constraints, blah, 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 are so different that doesn't doesn't exist an actuator that can do both. Right, so you can't represent the object and what's on the texture of the object at the same time. Not not with the, the level of complexity that you're aiming to, that, that the user thinks that uh, it could be possible. I see. Um, normally, in haptics, uh, what you search, in, at least in science, what you search is usability. So the haptics allows you to do something that without haptics you cannot do, more than haptics allows you to get more immersed. Because um, the, tact, the tact is so sensible that uh, it's really difficult to, to fool it. What you do is normally you do something that makes sense and so allows you to do something more. Do you mean like difficult to fool the human? Yeah. Of, okay. It's really difficult to, to, to give a touch, uh, a reproduced touch, the feeling of something real. Right. It's something that has not yet been achieved. So are you familiar with, um, so things like the void, where yeah. they'll, they'll try and use real world objects mm -hmm. to try and simulate those kinds of things. Um, so there's one company that is using for like empty theaters, they'll come in and set up uh, virtual displays and they send like a kit to these companies where a lot of it is just like these metal pieces but the, the VR experience is set up one-to-one -to, -one to where those are going to be. So that way, when you touch something, you'll get that feeling of sense of something being cold or hard, or it'll be the general shape of the object you're picking up. So you put things in the real world that have the texture and feel that they're going for uh, to kind of to, to basically trick the user into thinking, like, this is what I'm seeing, this is what I'm feeling, this is that object. Um, and I guess it's much easier to do it with an actual object yeah. than, than it is to do it with a mechanical device that tries to simulate that object. I totally agree with you. There is, I mean, don't see in the foreseeable future and the foreseeable future of the next 20 years, uh, how we can replace all of the property of the real object with the haptics, with the haptics display. And uh, this is, it's, it's a quest that is going on since 60 years. Right. And um, the, the problem is that the technology didn't change. It's not that uh, because the haptics is mechanics. Mechanics is expensive since a long time. I mean, robotics is expensive. Yep, right. And yeah. that's the problem. So basically, um, because the touch is it's something you think, yes, it's a sense like vision. There is a three colors and the three colors, you perceive them and then you reconstruct the image as such a thing. Or the sound, which is, okay, you have 23 different channels, you filter your sound and you perceive it. Touch is a little bit different. So it's not absolutely clear right now, even in the research community, how we actually encode the touch, how we actually, which is the perks that you pick up. That is, right. There is a little, some information, but you don't know it. But without knowing it, how the hell are you capable to building a display that do everything? Because you don't even know where to start. 
So, so you're saying we don't know how touch works? We know, uh, we have an, a general understanding how touch works. We don't have a precise understanding, let's say you pick up the green, the, sorry, the, the green, the blue, and the red, like RGB, right? I see. There is no such a thing for touch. Right. Right now, you are still, um, we are still, okay, we can do that, so we could do that. Then you test and you see if it works, and then you go on from there. It's really an, not empirical, but almost. Right, so it, it sounds to me like right now, you have to pick a very specific thing and then build a device around that one thing. Absolutely. That is the, that is the methodology that is, is till now is the only methodology that allowed haptic systems to be effective and marketable. That means that is able, you're able to bring it to the market with a convincing use case. I see. And uh, all of the haptics company that tried the other way around, which is I want to increase the user experience slash the immersion of, of the user right. are struggling on the market. I, That's, see. I mean, I was, I know really well that, for example, they hold the haptics company that brings textures over the smartphone, really high okay. fidelity textures yep. over the smartphone. And none of them is, is, is cutting, is cutting in because the problem is that as soon as uh, is, is done the, uh, why the haptics is there. That means pick up the phone when it's in your pocket. All the rest is not evaluated enough to pay the price tag on top of that. I see. And uh, I assure you, haptics has a really high price tag. It's really expensive. Yep. Especially when you, when you because the me it's mechanics, and mechanics is generalistically an expensive, an expensive toy. Yep. Uh, so when I tried your demo at SVVR last year, you had uh, 3D printed Yes. Devices. Yes. Um, so I'm assuming that the, uh, 3D printing basically allowed you to have rapid prototyping. Yeah. Uh, for these kind of devices. Um, so do you want to kind of go into how you went from there to in December getting one million in funding? Yeah, uh, absolutely. Hardware devices. I mean, um, that's a really interesting topic. I mean, you start. We are. Um, we start with my team. My team. It's. We, I'm not the only haptic scientist. We are four in my team. So everybody, I'm, I'm more neuroscience guy or algorithmist guys. And there is a, a hardware guy, mechatronics, one really, really strong software haptics guy that's do software for haptics since a long time. And one, one really good product manager that works on haptics before. So we have a good team. And that's a starting point. A couple of patents. That is always a starting point. But I mean, in haptics, patents is like, okay, it's better that you know what you're doing. But what uh, we focalized on. It is, okay, I have a haptic device, but this is just a starting point. It's not the end point. And I say, but what we work on is, what do I do with this haptic device? What is the convincing use case that can bring in front of investors to tell them, this haptic device is, is necessary for this, this, and this reason. Otherwise, these things, you don't do them, so there is no market. And the convincing point has been the professional training and specifically the hands-on professional training. So the, the point it was with these systems, we can digitalize convincingly a big part of the professional training hands-on, which is the starting of the generation of the motor memory, which is See. training it is, I know where I am. So if you break it down the process, I know where I am. I know the consecution of action that I need to do. Yep. So, so the idea is to make sure they know that environment so well that they can do it with their eyes yes. closed. Even in VR. Absolutely. And when you do a rise close, then you go in reality and you make it better, make it better. But you already know everything. Also the movement of the fingers, the movement of the hand, you already know everything. And that is can basically increase the effectiveness of, of the training from 30, 40% that is right now, which is the consecution of action to 70, 60, 70%. And, and the, that percentage is like success rate or like ability to- Now, if you, task, if you break down the, the process of, of training from zero to hundred percent, the hundred percent you're good, good to go for standard, you know, standard actions. That is really generalistic stuff. I mean, the, the, the surgeon is 15 years of training. Right. I cannot digitalize the 70% of that, otherwise it would be multi-billionaire, right? Right. So you need to be pragmatic, but there is a lot of hands-on training, like you know, soldering, such a thing, that the, the aim is being able to use the tool in security, be able to use the tool in autonomy, right? But if you don't train the motor memory, the first time that you go with the tool, you're not trained to use it. What you're looking for is that the user, when it, it, it passed from virtual reality to reality, 
it doesn't have any barrier. So that means that this motor memory, memory is trained, but the motor, motor memory is based on touch. Right. And because it's a machine learning system. Your motor memory, is, it means that you're not thinking what to do. That means it's automatized. Automatized means it's machine learning. So you need the feedback. You need to correct the mistakes. So that was the convincing use case that we built up. It means we don't have an interface that allows us to digitalize the hands-on training in a scalable manner, not in, in general. Scalable manner, it is one product, one size. I potentially can break down the price in, a, in the long run, in a really low, low level. And if in five years, in three years, you need to produce one million of them, I can do it. I see. Um, which is strongly differentiating us from competition. Because it's uh, the biggest problem of, of haptic device of competition in virtual reality is the non-scalability of their hardware. Right. Because, and the hygiene issues associated with that hardware. Well, it, like it's, it's also a very new technology, so I assume there are very few manufacturers. No, that's a, yeah, absolutely not. It's not new technology. It's okay. more okay. than 40 years. I see. I mean, exoskeleton, I mean, there is a company in France that is called Haption. They do exoskeleton since 35 years. All of the company has it. They just sell to top company because they, they are ready to pay. But they never scaled their business because they never found the, the capability to scale. I'm not saying that nobody will make it. That's, that just till now, uh, it's a little bit more complex than what it seems because for stupidly, if you cannot allow people to do hands-on training in autonomy, that means that they are able to put their device alone. Doesn't make sense, right? But it's difficult to put two exoskeletons in two hands alone. That's really, really complex. On the other side, the glove systems are really nice. However, you have a health issue. You cannot share it with people. Oh, right, because you have to clean it. Yes. And, and uh, for example, in VR in healthcare here, they don't even consider it. Right. That means, that, no, full stop, because it's not, it's not hygienic. So there is uh, some kind of barriers that, for example, glove system for haptics will be really good at home for playing. Because it's your stuff, you buy your size, it's tailored for you, and it's perfect. However, when you think about, you know, training in factories, training in facilities, you know, public arcades, whatever it is, the, the necessity to share the material, there is starting to get a little bit more complicated. Uh, then the setup is so long that so like for we're talking about VR arcades, right? If you're trying to do a consumer experience, um, your money is based on how many people you can get in and yeah. get out. Um, so it's, and you need to do a lot of turnaround. So if you have this device that, well, it's going to take 10 minutes to set up and then we got to calibrate it. So like about 30 minutes in, you can start the experience um, and maybe you'll be done, you know, with that in like 20 minutes, right? Where it takes longer to set up than that. Especially if you need someone to help you to set it up. So you need to right. pay five people to, 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 to dress five people. That's not economically available. So when uh, we were presenting to the investors, we were presenting also this case, which is, look, we know that the technology, for example, my technology has the same fingertip performances of the haptics technology. The guys there, it's basically exactly the same principle. I don't have all the rest of the hands, but what I can tell them is, is look, okay, but in real world usage, my system can, can be deployed, used and maintained in autonomy. Other kind of systems will require someone that give you a hand, right? Yep. And so for some kind of a use case, their system will be better. So kind of use case, my system will be better. So haptics is always about which battle you want to win. Right. So choose your battle wisely. So from your perspective, um, when we talk about these devices, when I talk to you at SVVR, you mentioned that you know, you had these 3D printed devices and the value add because of scalability reasons uh, wasn't necessarily in the hardware, even though that's the thing that people are putting on and can visualize. That's what the end consumer, the people training interact with. It's the, the thing that you've built that is, has value because it allows a versatility between different types of hardware. So things like OptiTrack, the Vive Lighthouses, Vive trackers, and, the, and you can bring in any kind of hardware to work with this. So the, the question from a software level that like a software developer want to know is when the user gives like a certain amount of force, how much feedback should a certain thing get? So one of the, your, the example that you had was like a, a fire uh, where you put in and then uh, the deeper you got into the fire, the more feedback you got. 
Um, and so I, you'd want an SDK to where that's consistent across experiences. So if I uh, went into one experience and this much force moved the ball 10 feet, but we don't want to go into another experience where this much force moved the ball five feet. Uh, so do you think there's value more so in building that software layer that other hardware can build off of? Uh, so even if like the hardware that you build doesn't take off, they can at least integrate with your software because you've done all that legwork that integrates easily with Unity and other things like that. I absolutely convinced that the value comes from the platform. And, uh, and the value comes from the tools that are uh, useful for the platform. So the problem, again, the problem with haptics is nothing existed. So it didn't have a driver, it don't have anything, right? So we need to build a chain. When you have the chain in, in place, you can start to optimize tools and then you start to divide the work, right? So what the case that we, that we built was, okay, look at haptics was, nobody was thinking that could be scalable. But look at this, this hardware potentially scalable, the interoperability is potentially scalable, so it can be done. If it can be done, it means there is a, a consistent use case on top of that. So we start to specialize. Specialize in what way? The, you need an, a, a layer of abstraction on, over haptics. What does that mean? I mean, I code haptics for my devices. It means you can drive them directly, you can drive them through, through parameters, you can drive them in a lot of different ways. But the way that you drive them, it's forcefully uh, consistent with my hardware. However, what you're working right now is an abstraction of the methodology of interaction that you can have in virtual reality with the hand. So, it is the meaningful haptics parameters that you can represent, that are useful in virtual reality. Of course, the weight is not one of them because there is no mass. So how the hell you can reconstruct the weight for haptics? You can't, you need the robot. But if you want a robot, drive the robot. I'm not interested in implementing it, right? Yep. So you can break down the haptics problem into relevant haptics problem. What you're building right now, neuroscientifically speaking, is uh, having a look at each one of these problems and making a, a generalistic way to encode the methodology of reproduction. Generalistic. That means these physical quantities that is picked up by the brain as textures, as vibrations, as stiffness, as whatever you want, button, we are capable to encoding it in a general manner. So what will open up the, the platform soon, I mean, 2019, I, I hope, that is, okay, I will open, say, I use this, I do it in this way, and this is a generalistic methodology to do it. That means that I, my hardware will go on, I mean, that will be my, my driver for the market. However, if the next guy wants to do a haptic hardware, which is not in competition with mine, but can do something better for a different kind of market, doesn't have to rebuild the whole chain. I see. He can just plug in into my methodology, and he can use it, and he can use even my developed content because it will be built up in a generalistic manner for haptics. Right, and then other developers also don't have to learn a new set of exactly. language for the new hardware. That's the point. And because the fragment, if, if VR is frag fragmented, haptics even worse. <laughs> we don't even have a, a, a platform to discuss. I and mean, we'll not say that mine is perfect platform, but it will be at least a, a platform to discuss. And then you can build tool for this. The question is, how do you design haptics? No fucking clue. <laughs> yeah. There is a way to a methodology to do that. It, it, need, it needs to be cognitively inspired, but it comes from the coding. Again, right. if you don't have tool design, how can we, uh, can we push the, the solution? I'm not so bold to say my solution solve of the problem. I will be the only one in the game. No way. But at least you can say I built an interface that makes sense where other people maybe will not be 100% perfect for them, but they don't need to redo the job. You know, like I wasn't able to build the whole house, but here's a foundation that you can yeah. build off of. And it will be the, I, we hope that it will be the same foundation to use. So you generate a methodology and you can share best practice and you can generate community around there. Because the problem with haptics still now, there is no community. Okay. I, was, I was about to ask if there was anyone you were working with in the haptics community. I, I am working with haptic community guy. I mean, but the research groups of people that do haptics is so small. I mean, we are 100 in the world including professors. And it's really, really uh, not a lot of people. And uh, we are discussing, of course, I meet them every, every two months. We, we see each other, we discuss, we start to think, but everybody has his own problem, right? And for this haptics part, I don't know in the other companies that do haptics, any hapti haptician 
I mean, I, I don't know if they come from research. So they are not in the community of haptician that I, I, I work with. I'm really open to discuss, absolutely. I say, come, guys, come. I want to write down this white paper, which is the kind of a coding. And it's kind of a coding. Let's talk about it. And uh, I assure you, it's a little bit more complex than what you think it is vibration on, vibration off. It's really, really a little bit more complex than that. That's why it needs to be, as let's say, the RGB standard design, designed. Right, and it's about like how much force you're, you're putting on. So your current hardware that you have does about 1.5 Newton, yeah. newtons per square inch, which is uh, equivalent to nearly ha a little less than half a pound per square inch. Yeah, I believe. Um, so uh, do you have a like something to put that in words, whereas other people can understand in, in layman terms of roughly, you know, is it's like pushing a basketball or, or what? I mean, um, it's holding, I mean, for three fingers, it's like holding um, a cup of coffee. I see. That okay. is, that is yep. the, level, uh, the level of stuff that you can really easily do. I see. Because that's the weight that is equivalent and, to... And uh, just so everyone can kind of understand the, the device that you currently have, do you want to describe just how it works? Because um, yeah. people call you like the VR glove without a glove. Yeah. Uh, because you get the moving of the fingers. You have IMUs in there um, to where... You, I'm assuming you can do some rough finger tracking as well? Or We are... we are. This is the second thing that we are building up over interoperability. But I will answer to the both questions. So what is our device? Um, Haptics, you can break it down in three different, roughly, uh, stuff. It is one of force perception, then is uh, uh, manipulations, and the other stuff is texture perception, right? Each one of it is dri driven by, by something else. Force is driven by tendons, tendons uh, um, uh, flexibility. Uh, manipulation is driven through skin indentation, and texture is, is, is driven through high-frequency vibrations, right? We are using skin indentation. Okay, skin indentation is I compress, decompress the skin, and this is reproducing what in reality happens when you manipulate an object. Compress more, not compress, is not contact, compress more, it's more contact and such a thing like that. Haptics glove works similarly. They use a pneumatic system, I use a mechanical system. But this, uh, uh, and the result is exactly the same. I have more bandwidth because my system goes faster. They can add a little bit of temperature because they are heating up the air. Okay, the choice is just uh, just correlated on how much portable you want it to be, right? So my system is a fingertip uh, actuator. It goes on the fingertip. Why on the fingertip? Because there is less variability on the different fingertip of the user than on the hand. So I have one size fit all system. I don't need to have two, three, five, seven slides, seven sides. So I can uh, uh, compress the cost of the hardware. Because it will fit multiple people. I fit 98% of the population. The only people that I don't fit today is the people with really long nails. Okay. Yeah, because I, I didn't think about <laughs> the beginning about the girls with really long nails. The next version will, uh, will fit. We are aiming for 99.9%. .9%. But because we st when you study, like headset, right? Uh, you study the ergonomics and you understand how much variable it is. And on that you say, okay, I can make it work. And okay, the VR glove without the glove. At the second part of the question, we have IMUs and gyroscopes inside, but we are not aiming to replace tracking systems. I'm not aiming to replace the leap motion. Leap motion is fantastic. Why have to do the job of one company that raised 130 million euro? Oh, sorry, dollars. Stupid. Yep. I will never be able to do it in so good in so short time. Yep. But leap motion has its downfall because it, I mean, have optical problems of tracking, right? And if you break it down in the science, there is no way that with one technology you can, you can track the hand. Manus VR has five trackers plus the glove. Yep. Because there is, you always have occlusion problems or drifting problems or disturbance problems for, uh, for magnetic systems, right? So you need something to compensate and make that a fusion. So what you're building right now is that, okay, just give me the position of the palm and then reconstruct the fingers through inverse kinematic. That will allow me to stay cross-platform, say, leap motion gives me a position of the palm, I reconstruct the fingers, but it will be more precise than the leap because I can, uh, I can avoid optical, illusion, optical occlusion. But then I can put my vibe tracker on the palm. I don't use the leap motion. Again, you have the, you have the fingers. You can put the IRT tracker here. 
you can put the mano motion uh, SDK system, you can put the usance. Exactly the same problem. Because, I mean, what I'm looking into is stabilizing the performances. Because if across, across systems I don't have the same performances, uh, the ex user experience will not benefit. So again, my platform will not work. See. So this, uh, we are stabilizing this input tracking because there are so many technologies, it's just stupid to build a new one, right? Correct. Yeah, you don't want to reinvent the wheel every time. <laughs> and otherwise, because I, I want a lot of friends and I don't want a lot of enemies, right? <laughs> so yeah. that's the point. Yeah, and it's just, um, so are you, are you working with any other companies as, as GoTouch, like having any partnerships with any of them yet? Or I cannot share. You cannot share. Okay, that, Sorry. that makes more sense. <laughs> I mean, you, yeah, you know that I mean, this yes. kind of stuff I cannot share. Yep. I can share uh, the partnership with my customers. That yes, I, I'm, I'm in partnership with BMW for professional training. I work with several uh, tra uh, several um, educational institutions in Italy for professional training. We already deployed the first haptic, uh, haptic classroom in the world. We already opened it up. We have uh, multiple postations, but people just uh, young young guys train on that. And it's working, it has been proven. I mean, they, they trained in autonomy over the mechanical systems, a mechanical machine, and they went down on the mechanical machine, they were able to use it without supervision. And that is driven through haptics because the clicking of buttons was stupid. The clicking buttons was the biggest problem. Right, because, yeah, how else do you, other than like a click, how do you communicate that in VR without any kind of haptic system? Well, you can't, <laughs> so you have to put it, make it visually, but more is different. The, um, what you see from what you're going to do, more the training is less effective. So it needs to be coherent uh, for the user to have a retention rate which is highest possible, right? But if the retention is not high enough, it just doesn't work. And what do you see as being like the next step for Hactics? Because it sounds like a very large elephant yeah. that this community is trying to tackle. Um, and you've made some progress, but what do you think is the next thing that uh, everyone can kind of converge on to make a breakthrough? I mean, my, I, I can talk about me. I mean, our battle is towards, I mean, GoTouch VR has been built to allow natural interaction in virtual reality, okay? My haptics is for natural interaction. It's not for immersion. I want to enable user to naturally manipulate and interact with objects. If in, the, in a way I increase the immersion, I'm happy with that. If in the way I'm not increasing the immersion, it's life. Because um, we're looking at the problem as I'm adding value of the current solution, or I'm just here to make uh, like a cherry on the, on the, on the, on the cake. Right. Yep. So I'm, I'm looking where I'm indispensable. Right. And I think it's more looking at as you want to do as good as or better, but not particularly like detracting from the experience, right? Yeah. Uh, I mean, we propose to our customers something that we can do better or enabling what something different that we already have. Regarding haptics, I, I can't talk for anybody else because I'm, my vision is a little bit switched. I use a haptic as a tool to do something. I not use haptics as, a, as, an, end, as an end game. I see. So for me, if it's good enough, it's good enough. Let's say I'm looking for making it smaller and make it more trans almost invisible and make it automatically wearing and making, you know, usable and make it um, compatible with augmented reality and make it compatible with the fact that you can manipulate real objects, you know, with it. So I'm working that direction based on the facts, okay, the haptic is good enough that you can manipulate. I'm happy. Then I, I move towards user, user center design. Like I say, uh, headset which are smaller, not more performing. More ergonomic. More ergonomics, uh, lighter. more lighter, more uh, more lasting batteries, maybe also auto charging batteries and wireless charging, something that makes it easier, way easier to use and decrease the, 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 the barrier to adopt the technology more than increase the immersion because in haptics, as soon as you start to push the immersion, the costs and the complexity just skyrocks. It's really skyrocketing. And what we don't want is give up the form factor because it's, we want to reduce the, imprint, the footprint of the tech. We don't, we don't want to increase it. I see. Um, so switching gears a little bit, uh, why don't we talk uh, a little bit about the 
difference that you've seen between startups in mm -hmm. Europe versus in U.S. Um, and some of the challenges of being either a U.S. or, or from your experience, a European startup um, where there are, there, you know, there's a lot of really creative people that you want to be able to talk to uh, that are out in San Francisco, right? Uh, what has it been like for you to try and kind of connect that intellectual gap, but also get what you need as far as like funding and partnerships in, in the U.S.? Take a lot of planes. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's the only way to do it. I mean, it's, um, since the beginning, even we didn't have any money, we're investing in planes tickets uh, to go and talk to people. And then it's about how you play it, right? You have one shot instead of 50, 50 from the local people. So you need to make it uh, va valid. So you need to put effort to prepare it and whatever. So the ecosystems in US, it's great. It's, it seems easier to get money here. Mm -hmm. uh, it's easier to make a mess around here compared to Europe. So <laughs> in Europe, uh, we tend, when you get money from VCs, you tend, the level where you get them, you are way more structured than when you get them here. Right? So, but there is less money. I see. Evaluation are lower. But, I mean, you pay less to people cost less, maybe quality, uh, same quality. They, they are really great school in Europe for engineering. You get really great people, many pay like one quarter of an MIT graduate, right? Yeah. But probably they are the same quality. It's not just because we don't speak English and you know, so the international uh, graduation are lower. I'm just bullshitting around, but yeah. it's, um, it's really different the methodology and approach to startup. It's we're really more structured in Europe and say, there is the seed stage, then you have to prove the market, you have to prove the tac tac tac, and you go on, you raise less money, you less, raise them less often, and it's difficult to explode in Europe. I see. Because it's difficult to create the basis for exploding. You have a market that's smaller because they are a regional market, every culture has the own one. In US it's faster to explode, and it's faster to get money, but, uh, I mean, you have to live with what you have. So if you want to start to make a connection, you just, just have to take a plane and uh, go there, talk to people, come here in Boston, talk to people, talk to you, get yep. invited <laughs> to the podcast, but I'm really happy about that. Yep. So it's really, it's an effort, but it has to be done. Right. Um, and as far as like the VR communities, uh, how, like how large are like in Milan, like how large is the VR community there versus... Uh, say like New York or Boston? And oh, that's a really great question. So virtual reality has been a European sport till five years ago. So it's crazy the amount of work that's been done in uh, especially in France uh, for virtual reality for uh, from the so systems. You know the so system what who they are? Uh, D3? These three, these the guys that basically the 100% of 90% of the product in the world are designed through their softwares. SolidWorks, Katia, 100% of the transportation system are designed through Katia. No, it's the, basically the engineering company. I see. And they do virtual reality since 25 years. And basically their brother's, brother's company, which is the Soviet Aviation, they do military, military, military planes, They're the French military planes. The, the past military planes, the, the last one, has been designed completely in virtual reality. But before Oculus existed, through caves, yep. such a thing, there is a lot of caves in France. There is a, at least a, a 10 cave for every city. Yep, and, and I think a lot of that came out of like military budgets of let's take this hardware. No, not really. Nope, not at all? No, no, no. Okay. It, comes, uh, it comes from uh, automotive. Automotive and aerospace. I see. It is, uh, it is Airbus, it is uh, BMW, Mercedes. All of them needed a way to validate their designs uh, before making prototypes. And so they invested heavily in virtual reality. All of the cars in, the, in, uh, in Europe are designed in virtual reality. Yep. And uh, have you found that now those kinds of systems are being done on consumer technology yes. as opposed to the proprietary yes. historical? Yes, they're, all of them have, uh, a, for engineers, all of them basically have a headset to validate their designs. I mean, that's why aviation use uh, Oculus with uh, Leap Motion. Other guys use uh, HTC. However, they are using even more the caves. I was talking with a virtual reality head of Barco, you know, Barco ecosystem. They are the, the biggest provider of uh, projectors. All the iMacs have a Barco projectors. They are the biggest provider of projectors for, for VR caves. And he told me 
So just the HMD came at the beginning. I had a decrease of uh, of my of my of my market shares, and that's what you expect, right? Right now it's exploding because the amount of quality of VR experience that I can provide, there's no way that an HMD can do it because my uh, solution is almost infinite, and you can have multi people inside, and you have no HMD. You have just polarized glass, but the quality is the same. And um, so it is that they use HMDs, they use all the other technologies, and so they are mixing it up as a function of the use case that they want to have. Uh, and to get into haptics right now, uh, would someone need to go through the academic route first before trying to join a commercial team? Like Oof. Um, as far as I know, there is just only one course in haptics in the world, is master. And it is done in Paris in the UPMC. It is a really good comp uh, university done by Vincent Hayward, which is the haptic guy. It's, it's called Dr. Dr. Touch. So this is his nickname. It's a really funny guy. <laughs> and uh, Dr. Touch? They, they, they call it Dr. Touch. Because it's, because it's, <laughs> he's, uh, he, he, if you look at him, it's like he is the optics. Basically, he and there is a one guy here in the US, but he is really the the visionary guy, you know, the, the Steve Jobs of haptics is this guy. And um, if you really want to understand what's going on, the PhD is so it's fundamental. I mean, you, you cannot give it up. Um, I wouldn't, let's say, not trust, but it's really more complicated what you think haptics. You need to have to bang your head against it a little while with someone that also explained to you how it works to be able to go out. There are books, but uh, I mean, it's a hands-on work. You need to build devices, you test devices, optimize devices, and get, you know, make experiment, get to know your field you a little bit better. You can't just go get the Arduino equivalent of, for, for haptics no. and then just Not be able yet. to build your own Not thing yet. yet. Uh, so it sounds to me like a part of it is just because that chain doesn't exist, you kind of no. have to start from the bottom. Yeah, you need to have a, 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 a reasonable understanding of the chain. But the reasonable understanding of the chain by not having any ecosystem that allows you to you know, build a little bit and, uh, and mess around with that, you do it in university. And, uh, or you are lucky enough to be hired by immersion corporation that you can do it in company, but all the rest is either in university or a partner of your university. Let's say Blue Haptics is the guys from NASA, right? I mean, they're, yep. they're uh, academics guys. They're really in partnership with that. Or you work in, a, in or you work in, um, in NASA or in ESA or uh, space agencies, but you do telerobotics. So this is the one of the path to do it. I, it's not easy to mess around with that, or at least you can mess around with that, of course. I don't know which is the results. There is not easy way to judge the results because you don't have a framework of reference. And so, do you have? Uh, ideas for even just outside of VR, how haptics can yeah. be used? Well, yeah, it's thousands of them. Yeah. I mean, I was working before as a technical director of a company that is building uh, haptics for telephones, shopping. Capability to reproduce texture for a telephone. It's an amazing way to, inc to increase uh, dramatically the turnover of uh, online retails because, I mean, one, two, three quarter of the online sales doesn't happen because the user cannot touch the object especially tissues, if you're able to give them a hint of that, you can step up, that is one. Haptics for example, ultra haptics, it's really fantastic, you know, ultra haptics technology, it's the mid-air yep. haptics, fantastic technology. But the real use case of ultra haptics is to replace the switch the buttons in, in uh, let's say, in, uh, in uh, sterile environments. Because if you don't, not, you don't need to touch them, you're not going to to lose the take infections. Right. But for hospital, yeah. it's amazing. You reduce the contact with something that can be, that everybody touch. And so you, it's a, a way to, to share diseases. Yep. Cars, replacement of all the bottoms in all the cars and replace them with haptic systems. Because um, you cannot, I mean, Tesla, it's really nice car, but you know why all of the others didn't yet adopt it, the, the screens? But because it's absolutely unsafe, because the, the capability to do an action without the, cap the haptics, I mean, the buttons is uh, that, that, that touch feedback that is recognizable. 
you, decre you increase the time of interaction. So you decrease the security because you pass more time to look at the interaction and to look at the, at the, at the street. Right, and you're distracting the driver. Yeah, and that's the real reason why. It's, so you need a haptics for that. But the ability to make a haptic button and uh, Actronica is a company in France of Dr. Touch, the guys there that built his actuators and is really performing one. They're already integrated in Porsche, right? They pre presented at CES this year Porsche with haptics buttons that can be replaced. And that allows to standardize the production chain because you don't need different, different molds for different buttons. All of them are the same. Decrease the production cost. Apple, you know why they put haptics in their systems? Because you decrease the dimensions. I see. They said haptics allowed me to make my MacBook Air thinner. Because you didn't need these big buttons. Yeah. And you don't need the displacement. It was less hardware. Yeah. It's, uh, I mean, haptics has a tons of application. But as you as you look in there, all of these applications that the market seems like they are market viable are not going looking for immersion, are looking for increase, enable something that was not even able before. I mean, ultra optics for you're not getting diseases. The other one is you don't need to print buttons because you get them. It also seems like uh, interaction time in order to complete an action. Sorry? So uh, like from an e-commerce website, uh, if you just from like a software design kind of kind of perspective uh, with like UI, you want as few button clicks as possible yeah. to get to the checkout, yeah. right? And get that conversion into money into your business's hand. So from this angle, we're kind of looking at it as now you want to reduce the time that you're even interacting with the button. Uh, and it sounds like haptics can do that to, to add, it's like if, like you said earlier, like when you're interacting with the car, you press the button, um, it's the longer it takes, the less time the driver's spending um, on specifically just mm -hmm. that. So if, if I can interact with my phone faster, I'm going to spend more time on my phone, yeah. right? So that's like Apple's value add of having haptics is if I can do more actions in a smaller period of time, this device now has more value to me. And if that device is something that, like we're for Apple, right? There's an entire marketplace there, uh, so more time on that is more revenue for them, right? Um, uh, can I be straight? I yes. don't. I don't have an answer for your question. I. I, I don't know. Yep. I don't have a um, in mind a strategy that haptics can decrease the number of clicks that to arrive to a checkout, for example, or increase user engagement. For example, personally, I hate haptics when I click uh, the, clicks my keyboard on the on the telephone. I hate it. Like for me, it's just mind blowing it's how weird. much I hate yeah. it because it's not correlated to what I see. I see. There is people that hate it, people who use it, people. In fact, if you look at your phone, haptics is really it's not used a lot. It's just, just when you need to have an information, right? Right. So it's picking up. You pick up the phone. You want you want the game. It vibrates a little bit. There's a lot of, I mean, immersion corporation is pushing, yeah, haptics increase the, you, the, the video, the video stuff, and such a thing. Yes, but there is, is it re re reasonable to spend too much time to design haptics for so small Mind body? advances. Yeah, right. it's not, has been measured, but it's not enormous on the user engagement. Let's see. At least with haptic technology till now, it's not like you're doubling it. Maybe you're adding two, three okay. percent. So it's a still a trade-off. Does it make sense for me to make it properly? I spend a lot of time on doing that instead of, I don't care. Right. Uh, and so back to specifically like the device that you're working on is the material that you made it with was to try and make it uh, very easy to, to clean off. Yeah. Right. And that's part of like the creating that sterile environment. Yeah. Um, and is, is that because you were specifically thinking of a certain use case like healthcare? For them to be used then? Because we were using, since the beginning, we were discussing, always thinking about the capability to share the device. So okay. by sharing the device, you need to be able to comply with the, with the health regulation that you have on the workplace. In the workplace, you cannot share a cloth. There is no way. A tissue. I, I wear uh, my protective gear. I cannot give it to you because it's mine. Because it is blah, blah, blah. All the, all the health issues. And 
but we're researching a glove, a smart glove. It's a glove. So a smart glove still complies with the same regulation. So if you are looking to be implemented into business and to be a boot that can be shared, you need to comply with these rules. So since the beginning, you, want, you wanted to comply with the rules. That is, if I make a device, I can share it. Or I can use it in a sterile environment, you can easily clean it. So since the beginning, this was one of our design rules. All right. Uh, so we're getting down to our last like few set of questions. So what, what are, right now is the next steps for, for GoTouch VR? Mm -hmm. Um, is it making partnerships? Is there like advances you want to make on the hardware? Like, what do you think the next few steps are? So our um, future steps are for sure create a uh, um, network of partners globally that are interested to use the technology. These partners are content creators that works on the B2B market, healthcare and uh, manufacturing training for Star Wars. Starting in, in Europe, we have a few of them, really good one. We are starting with in the US, came here, we have a really, really nice discussion with a lot of people that has relevant use case. The relevant use case is I have this one, I have to manipulation training, and uh, your device helps me to, because it's my, my retention rate is higher. So we have a really, I mean, a reasonable production that we can sustain, let's say, at most 300 devices a month, which is an okay production to start to discuss to people, make POC, start to make deployment, and really transmits this knowledge of the haptics because they, I cannot do everything alone, right? I need to empower people to use it. Second thing, we are working directly with universities. The academics program, we are already working with kind of quite a lot of experts of, haptic, of virtual reality around the world. Few of them are were here also today. And we are sharing our kit, our expertise again. If you want to test it on research, this is to validate the approach, right? Uh, Ultra Haptics is a similar academics program. I share it with the university. Third thing is we directly work with large organizations that have virtual reality, system, virtual reality studios inside. For example, Airbus has their own guys inside because they do virtual reality since a long time. And we're discussing with them to say, I have use case, yes, you want to adopt the technology because that will validate, validate it. That's a general point of view, right? I'm not Oculus, I don't have 3 billion euro. So I need to create a case for myself. So this one. And, uh, and of course, alliances. And alliances with who matters, who matters is who get the guys who do tracking, the guys who do headset, the guys who do this kind of stuff. But again, to arrive there, you need to arrive to a certain level of, of, of structure of your solution and such a thing. So we are working in all this round. So partners, content creators, large organization, academia on one side, alliances for, um, for technical point of view on the others. I see. And why not federate the other haptic company? I would really love to do that. We have to, to sit around the table, start to discuss about this capability to have a common language of discussion. Uh, and last question: Are you currently only sharing your hardware with uh, businesses, or can consumers also get their hands on? And if so, how? I'm not selling to customers today. I see. Um, for several reasons. Uh, first reason is that. Uh, it's, I mean, if you mess around and play around with it, it's nice, but uh, I, if I send the hardware to someone, I'm losing money today. Really, if I sell you hardware, I'm losing money. So uh, just because there, is a, there was a lot of engineering behind, so it's, I need to make a case to sell hardware. It needs to be an, it's still an investment for me to give the hardware to someone, even if I ask you to pay X thousand dollars. I, I cannot go back to the money. So my investors are pretty strict there, say, yes, okay, you need to invest on something that can generate revenues in the future. So we're investing a lot in branding and business to business. This is, this is the reason. And the second reason is, uh, I mean, you don't even have a way to design haptics. It's, it's, you open it up and it's, it's nice. It's really easy to implement. However, as soon as you want to push a little bit, but let's normally when we kick in with our expertise, we try to share it. So we are looking to open up to customers in the near future or future, but it's, it's of course in our roadmap. This specific here, we are not yet there. So I don't want to deceive and say uh, tomorrow we'll do it, but we will do it, of course, but not tomorrow. Only when it makes sense. Yeah. Right. So, uh, all right, it looks like we're out of time. Uh, I really want to thank you for coming all the way from Milan just for this podcast. Okay, obviously you're here for the conference. 
Uh, but we no, no, no. To... I'm here for the podcast, and the conference was just here. I mean, I just <laughs> happened to be there. Zach, awesome. Uh, and this has been another episode of the Virtuality Podcast. Uh, we'll see you in this reality. Or the next. Thank you so much for listening. We would like to keep sharing more about VR and AR with you, so please consider a few dollars to our Patreon linked in the show notes. The Virtuality Podcast is produced by Jason Parks and music by Rachel Dzinski. This podcast is in collaboration with Boston VR and Boston AR. Monthly meetups and events can be found on meetup.com. You can also follow us on Twitter at VirtualityCast and learn more at our website, virtuality.show.